Okay, we're back. Um, so now we move on to the next uh, major example. So this yet again is a case study, uh, taking a bit of mathematical text and trying to make sense of it, analyzing the types and, and trying to make a basically first order logic uh, expression from it. So um, this is a joint work several years ago with Cesar Ionesco, who was also an initiator of um, this course. And I do hope you see uh, the Jamboard uh, with um, the quote, the main quote that we're analyzing for the rest of the, uh, this Jamboard session. So this is a quote from a book by Sussman and Wisdom. And actually, uh, they are in turn quoting. So now we're down to recursive quotes again. Um, but let's, let's read the quote. So it says that a mechanical system is described by a Lagrangian function. And here I added as, a, as an annotation, because it doesn't say explicitly that the L down here in the equation is actually what they call the Lagrangian function, because that's not obvious. Uh, the Lagrangian function is a function of the system state, which apparently has a time and some coordinates and some velocities. And the motion of the system is described by a path that is allowed to, uh, that gives the coordinates for each moment of time. So a little bit like we had just before the break saying that X and Y are in turn parameters uh, or functions of T. Uh, a path is allowed if and only if it satisfies the Lagrange equations. And traditionally, they are written in this form. And then is the question from that book, what could this expression possibly mean? And here I'm not intending to make fun of the Sussman and Wisdom book, which I a little bit did when I make fun of the, the calculus book in the uh, analysis of the complex numbers appendix. But here they actually do something very similar to what we are trying to do. They're trying to make sense of this definition from a functional program perspective, the Sussman and Wisdom book. The only thing I don't quite like about their approach is that it's untyped. It's a scheme uh, based book and we're using Haskell and similar things here. Anyway, what could this expression possibly mean? So that was is what we were going to dig into. So I kept the core uh, definition here at the top and let's see if I can actually move to the next frame. So the equation is the one up here, or actually, as it says in the text, the equations, there's a plural. So this is supposedly more than one equation hiding here somewhere. Anyway, the use of notation for the partial derivatives. So notice these curly deltas that we've seen in the first half. That suggests that the L function be defined as a Cartesian product of a number of real number parameters where it's at least two. So otherwise you wouldn't use a partial derivative normally if it's at least, if it's only one. But notice there is also a straight D in the definition. So this is the derivative with respect to time. So that on the other hand, we have to deal with in the next slide that is only relevant for the T coordinates. But okay, so, this, this partial derivative thing is consistent with the description that the Lagrangian function is a sys function of the system state, time, coordinates, and velocities. So there are at least three things. I mean, it says coordinates with the plural here. And that means that coordinates could also be x and y or x, y, z, or actually any number of coordinates because the Lagrangian equations can be used to describe a system with many moving targets so it could be the whole um, star i mean the, the whole um, solar system with all its planets and their motions and then it would be a vector of coordinates which would be on the order of 30 and so on anyway let's make it as simple as we can to start out and use and say that it is this plural is just one coordinate so if this is one value then we have one time value one coordinate value and one velocity. So we can take this i to be three. So, and I, I use this r to the power of three notation to mean r cross r cross r, or equivalently that, that input to L is a triple. 
It's three real numbered values. And I will give that name, the type R3, I will actually call S for system state. And I will use this Cartesian product notation again. So it's a triple of a time, a coordinate, and a velocity. Where I usually will use the name T then for time, which notice in the equation, we have a derivative with respect to time. So that sounds relevant. A Q for coordinate, we have a derivative with respect to, to, to the coordinate. And then we use V for velocity. We haven't seen velocity used yet, but we'll get back to that. And in practice, they will all be real numbers, but you can consider this last comment a type declaration in Haskell. So type T equals real, type Q equals real, type V equals real, but it's useful to still have a name T to keep track of them. It's also worth thinking about that you don't really want to add a time to a velocity or a coordinate. So from uh, dimensional analysis, you know that you probably need to keep these, these three apart. So it's probably also useful if you want to code this up in Haskell and be sure of the correctness to each actually use a new type for T to make sure that there, it cannot be mixed with the Q and so on. But I will not do that here. I will just have these names as hints and they will all actually be equal to real numbers, to the type of real numbers. Okay, that was one part. So if we look at this, this partial derivative of L with respect to Q, I mentioned that before that the, the thing down here should be the name of a variable, which should be one of the three arguments that L has. So we don't know where L is defined, but we would expect that somewhere in a particular case, for a particular system, we would have the Lagrangian defined something like this. So L is an argument of three, as L has a three argument, a time, a coordinate, and a velocity. And then it's some mathematical expression. Who knows, T squared plus Q times V, something. Okay, so now we know that uh, roughly the type of L, or at least we have a hypothesis about the type of L. Let's see if it holds up. Now, we also know that when we do the partial derivative thingy, we start from a function and we return a function of the same type. So if we now had said that L should be this, then the result should also be a function like that. So we need to apply this to some particular triple later. But so far, let's just say that we know that this expression is a three argument function. So the equation here is actually not on real numbers. It's an equation between, well, expressions or functions. And now I've decided to use the function version here. And that means that also the right hand side here cannot just be the real number one, the zero, it has to be the function, which always returns the real number zero, regardless of the time, position and velocity of the system. Okay, so far we've analyzed the types of L, this part and the zero. Let's move one step forward. So now we have a little bit of a problem because we said before that what we here called d dt, and I've been uh, in the previous uh, lecture been calling just capital D without a subscript, that it has type r to r to r to r. So it takes a function and it turns a function of one argument. Now, on the other hand, if that should be the typing in this case, when this operator is applied to this expression, this expression better have the same type as well. So this should also be a function from just one R to R, or in this case, it ought to be the time then because it's derivative is respect to time. So actually I, I could write instead of R over here on the right, I could write T to R everywhere. Maybe I should do that to make it extra clear. T is equal to R, but we're expecting it to be the time variable. 
Okay, but then we also know that when we have addition or subtraction in a formula, we expect the two types on the both sides to have the same type. I mean, the two, two correspond, the, the two values to have the same type. So now we have a contradiction here. We got a problem. We have either, we have both argued that it should have a one argument, T, and that it should have a triple of arguments, T, Q, and V. Now we will get back to this, uh, but let's look at yet one another problem because we, we sort of we started out on the previous slide with this expression on the right hand side. We looked at it, this derivative. Now let's look at the, the other partial derivative. So this expression appears strange. I mean, q dot, what on earth is q dot? And I mean, it, it's mentioned in a book, and I think I mentioned in the previous lecture that, that often if you have a function, say f, then f prime is sometimes used as f dot. So dot is the, the derivative, especially if it's a function of time. So derivative, so basically I, I should say this is usually then intended to be df dt. So derivative with respect to time. But if that's the case, then what we have in the expression up here, let's uh, circle it. That is actually the partial derivative of L with respect to dL dt. So this doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we can't have, I mean, we, we're expecting uh, uh, syntactic, the, the name of a variable down here and not a partial derivative or, or a normal derivative or anything like that. So dq dt, yeah, so, so q, d, q dot, uh, sorry, it, it should be not del l, it was q, sorry. Well spotted, it should be dq dt. But so in any case, it's definitely malformed. It, it doesn't work that way. And here there's a need to know a little bit about physics or, or the underlying application domain. So what they actually mean is that it's derivative with respect to V, the third argument of L. So this would be a question mark, but what they re really intend to mean is to say the derivative of L with respect to V, which is also to say the derivative with respect to the third argument. Remember we said that L had T, Q and V as arguments. Okay, let's see what more we can deduce. Um, so there was one curious thing in the original definition, which talked about a dependency on time. And that was a path that gives the coordinates for each moment of time. So here, um, if we call the path w, then w should be a function from t to q. And in the general case, if q is uh, many coordinates, it's a little bit like the example I showed just before the break, that the function that both x and y are both functions of time. It could also be lots of variables, but here just for simplicity, we can say that um, so this, this is what this other part is saying, that it, it could be R could be the uh, N different variables here, but we will just use one, N equals one for the rest of the example. But in any case, this path seemed to be something important. So we need to find where in the equation up here that this W is, and, and clearly it, it's not visible. So it, it's, um, it's really is a bit of a strange notation because it's not written out. So let's, let's analyze W a little more at least to hint, give a hint at what we could be doing. So what, what do we know about W? Well, so W now is supposed to map time points to coordinates. So it means that if we know where we are in time, we will also know what position we are at. So the path, the trajectory is given uh, as a function of time. 
And at the derivative of this is the velocity. If we move, if we change the time, uh, the position in time, then we got the velocity. That's things we learned in, in high school. So that means that Q dot, which I also called V earlier, V being the time de derivative of Q is actually the derivative, the one argument function derivative of W. And the coordinate Q, it might look a bit strange here, but what I'm saying is that the coordinate Q as a function of time is W as a function of time. Okay, that means that if we have, this now I'm defining a higher order function called expand. So if we have a path, remember this was called path, oops, path. If we have a path in the coordinate Q, then we can extend it to tell not only where we, uh, where we are in um, Q, but also where we are in time and where we are in velocity. So this function expand the W takes a time, that's this T, returns as the first component, the time, second component, its position, and third component, the velocity at this particular time. So this is something that, because they talked about the system state being triples. So it, this means that if we know how the coordinate Q varies with time, we actually know how the whole system state varies with time. So it's a bit hard perhaps to imagine this in the three-dimensional space, but you, you have a function that defines both the coordinate and its velocity. Okay, let's see if we can use that to get the type correctness of the uh, equation to work out. And here I'm trying to, to uh, fit a little diagram up on the right, and I write in the diagram EX for the function expand. So let's look, to, look at a diagram. So expand w, that will take a time into a triple. And we need um, a function from time to the result of L so that we can take the time derivative of it. And if we use first this to create a triple, then we can use the partial derivative of L uh, with respect to Q to pick that point and compute it. So if we compose this function and this function, so this is what we're saying here. If we take, first we expand W and then we compose it with a partial derivative then we will get a function which goes from a time to just a real number via this other time. So it goes first here, and then it goes down there. Okay, and now to shorten the notation a little bit, I will move over to using the D with subscripts for the different derivatives. So remember from previous lecture, we had just a capital D, for the derivative in one argument, and that argument is now called time. D2 is the second argument derivative, partial der derivative with second argument. That's derivative up here. And we will use D3 for the derivative with respect to Q dot, which we know we, it was meant to be the V variable. Okay, and if we summarize that, then actually, we, the first term becomes the time derivative with respect to third derivative or the, the argument three derivative of L after expanding it. And the other term here is the derivative with second or the second argument after expanding it. And now both have the same type. Both this and this are functions from just time to R. So if we, if we put these expressions in, this is actually uh, the Lagrange equations or the Lagrange equation. We have just one here. Uh, and now we have a W, we have a path that we can be expressing. And as it's equal to the constant zero function, we have minus here. If we add this term on both sides, we can simplify and say, 
that the time derivative of velocity derivative after expand should be the same as the position derivative after expand. So that's what the Lagrange equation translates to. And to make it even slightly more concrete well, or <laughs> formal, uh, we can say we can define a predicate Lagrange of two arguments, L and W. That, that predicate holds if this equality holds. So we can have a, an example L and an example W, and then we can try to compute whether or not this path actually satisfies the physical laws that describes by the Lagrangian L. So in uh, this is used a lot in physics. I mean, it, it's, it's used in all kinds of places and, and it's uh, generalized into quantum theories and all kinds of theories. But the, the, the interesting thing for us here is that we've sort of managed to translate the mathematical text definition. We put types on it and we define basically a logical predicate that can be checked. If we have a candidate for what L should be in W, we can see if it actually is a motion of the system or not. And uh, as the unknown, Often you know the L from physics and then you know, want to know how the object moves. So as the unknown here is a path, which is a function from time to coordinate. Um, this is a partial differential equation. It has partial derivatives and a function as the output. We will not talk about solving partial differential equations in this course, but it's, we can definitely test if we have a candidate and there is some exercise on that as well. So let's do exactly that, make it a little more concrete by applying it to an example where we might recognize the result. So here I've defined one example expression for L. So remember it takes three arguments, L, X, and V. And here I've defined it so that it would model uh, gravity. So potential energy is this uh, component and kinetic energy is, is this component. So if you have something of mass M, some acceleration for, from the earth, g, and then uh, a velocity v. Then this is an energy expression. It's a, it's a difference between two energies. And we can use that to try to see if a certain motion is actually um, a, tr a correct motion of the system or not. And uh, well, how do we do that? Well, first, let's compute these derivatives. So this is again a little exercise in computing partial derivatives. Anyone have a suggestion for the first case, the derivative with respect to the third argument of L, which is V, of this expression? Remember everything else is kept constant and only V is varying, yes. So the first term is just constant, so it disappears. And the other one becomes 2mv two two MV divided by 2, and exactly as in the chat, that is just m times v. OK, any suggestion for what the other partial derivative would become? If we compute, yes, so minus mg. So notice again, now this time the, the second term is constant and disappears. And the first term has a linear function in x, which is this coordinate. I call it x instead of q here. So the coefficient before it is the result. So this is just minus m times g. So actually, uh, this is a constant function, so the whole uh, can really v really be constant in this case, that x not depend on v? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, the partial derivative is computing the derivative when something is kept constant. In this case, v is kept constant. So it's an interesting, from a physical point of view, clearly we can't be changing x freely and without changing the velocity. But mathematics, th this equation does uh, sort of describe the physical system. So you should here, take this leap of faith and say, okay, well, if we only change x and keep v constant, how much does it vary? So it is maybe counterintuitive, but this is the way you actually get the correct solution to the equation of motion. 
So we can define uh, a, part, a function of three different variables which are not connected. So the partial derivatives of L are not depending on the path. So, so far the path has not been involved, but it's a good question. Okay, so then just as to, to remind us then what, what is this extend uh, function? So remember it should compute a triple of a time, a position and a velocity. So if we want to compute this now in practice for our case, so our extend of our path, well, okay, sorry, we don't have a path yet. <laughs> so if we had a path, we would be able to compute this. So now we have to get to the point of saying, okay, what, what path do we want to work with? And this, um, uh, I don't know, is it uh, something, is the voice not perfect or, um, well, clipping or fading out? I'm not sure if this is, uh, because I'm, I tried to prioritize in the, Okay, so for some people it's, okay, good. Then it's not a, a universal problem. Okay, great. Um, so let's, let's try to guess a W. So here on the next slide, um, I've said, okay, let's, let's try, because we said we will not solve partial differential, differential equations here, but we can definitely check. So let's assume that this is the path of the system. It's some co constant a plus b times t squared. We just guess that a certain um, polynomial is the solution. And we can check if it's true. So with this one, the extension here would be the time. This is a plus b t squared. Oh, sorry. Yes, new screen. I was distracted by the sound here. Uh, sorry. So the time. Uh, a plus b t squared, and then the derivative with respect to time, which is then two times b times t. Okay, and here I've given names alpha and beta to two functions, uh, which I would like to compute, because in the end we will have to, to check if they're equal. So we've already computed the partial derivatives of L from an earlier slide. And now we want to compute alpha. So alpha is the composition of these two functions. So if we apply it to certain t, it will be dGL applied to x w t. And we know that that is this triple. So what is the right-hand side to be filled in here? Yeah, so we got m times v, and we know that v is 2bt, so it's 2mbt. I like that. So 2 times m times b times t. So what did I do? Well, I just extracted the third component as v and multiplied it by m. Okay, and that the next step is then to compute the derivative, because notice down here, we have the derivative of alpha. So the derivative of alpha with respect to t at the time t. Any suggestion? Yep. The suggestion is 2mb. So why so? Well, you know, alpha is a function of one argument and it's just a constant times that t. So its derivative here is always that. So we can actually write, if we want to be point free, we can write, write that this is actually const and then this expression. So it's the constant function always returning to mb. Okay, it means that we, we've actually done with the whole left-hand side of the equation. We can, we can write it here. This whole thing is actually const, well, const of 2mb. Okay, then we have to compute beta. Any suggestions for what the function beta should return? 
and where it's defined down here as this composition. Yeah, so the suggestion is minus mg. And here, notice that I've written underscores here because actually this function is constant. I mean, this expression doesn't depend on neither the time nor the coordinate nor the velocity. It's always minus mg. So clearly, this is minus mg actually for all paths w, whatever the path would be with this Lagrangian, this expression would be the same. Okay, and if I do the, the same transformation, this is actually const, the constant function always returning minus mg. So of course here as well then, const minus mg. So then the last question might be, can we solve this equation? Can we make the left-hand side function be equal to the right-hand side function? Well, two constant functions are equal if 2m b, if the constants are equal. So if this is equal to minus m g. And well, when is that equation satisfied? Any suggestion? Yeah, if 2b is equal to minus g, so if b is equal to minus g half. So let's move to the next frame where I've written that. And actually there are two cases. So remember this, this equation is also satisfied is m is zero because then this expression is zero and this expression is zero, whatever b and g are. So either m is zero or b equals minus g half. Now, can we interpret this in any physical way? So actually I, I'll just written it on the slightly more cleanly on the next slide. So either M is equal to zero and A and B can be whatever they desire. And this is basically a massless particle. So if we have something, a particle which doesn't have any mass, and it should satisfy these equations. Well, then the Lagrangian is always zero, which means, strictly speaking, that it's free to move in whatever you want, the way it wants. It can jump around in any ma manner. So it, it would sort of, a photon, for example, doesn't have mass. So I guess that would be an example, even though it doesn't move around in all kinds of strange manners. But at least uh, in this simplified model of physics, where we only have, uh, kinetic and potential energy that it would be able to. Okay, in the other case, then we have, the, the, it is A minus G half T squared. So basically A can be whatever. So it, this is a free fall. The acceleration is minus G and the starting height is A. So given a lucky guess, we could say, or at least a guess with some parameters, we managed to find a solution to the Lagrangian equations. So it's allowed to either move in whatever way it wants if it has mass zero, or in this particular way, if it has to satisfy the laws of gravity by having a mass. Okay, uh, that was all on the Jamboard. We have a little more time, so I will jump over to the live coding side. And as usual, I will stop and start recording.